In this episode, we will dive into ancient astronomy. We are going to explore how it came to be that Hipparchus from Nicaea, one of the foremost scientists of all antiquity, seemingly discovered the planet Uranus. But wait, you might now say, there is something amiss here. Well, I am your host, Morten Eriksson. Welcome to Ancient History. This is not Hipparchus from Nicaea. This is William Herschel. He was an Englishman, an astronomer, and is of course usually credited to be the one who discovered the planet Uranus. The discovery was made as early as 1781. To complicate things, however, the planet had been sighted by various astronomers before that. Hipparchus did it, as we shall see, in 128 BCE. John Flamsteed sighted Uranus, that did not have the name at that time, several times in 1690. The French astronomer Pierre Charles Lemonnier noted the planet several times, both in 1750 and 1769. So why are Herschel the one credited with the discovery? Well, no one until Herschel did recognize what they saw as a planet, but rather as a star. And this is also true for Hipparchus. And therefore, although, as we soon shall see, Hipparchus probably did the first known observation of the planet, Herschel will continue to stand as its discoverer. To find out how it has come to be, that modern historians and astronomers think that our protagonist did see the planet. We must use both history and modern science to reach a conclusion. So let's go back to the time of Hipparchus himself. Hipparchus was born in Nicaea in Bithynia, somewhere around the year 190 BCE. And he died sometime around 120 BCE. And we know this since he analyzed and published his astronomical observations after 127. And Ptolemaeus states that Hipparchus made his observations between 147 and 127 BCE. He spent most of his later life at Rhodos and seemed to have imported knowledge both from Alexandria and Babylon to his observatory. In the second century CE, the astronomer Claudius Ptolemaeus, also one of antiquity's most significant and influential scientists, used the adjusted coordinates from Hipparchus' star catalogue when he did his own observations and collected them into what is today known as the Almagest. Amazingly preserved, it is one of the most influential scientific texts in history, not the least the source of the 1200 years long die-hard geocentric model. In fact, Hipparchus calculated the world's first heliocentrical model, but Ptolemaeus ignored it. It is a treatise on the apparent motion of the stars and planetary paths, probably written sometime around the year 150 CE. Over a thousand stars and their positions are recorded in the Almagest. With high precision, taken into account the limited instruments used at the time. Modern calculations, adjusting for stellar motion and calendar changes done since ancient times, usually pinpoint the stars within an acceptable margin of error. However, from early on there have been one passage or set of coordinates that has been disturbing. A star in Hipparchus' observations that has always been amiss and that never have found any reasonable explanation to why it should be so out of place or even missing. This star is not in the constellation Virgo on the zodiac. There are several versions of the Almagest, transcribed at different times, but they all agree on the fact that, according to Hipparchus, there is meant to be a quadrilateral in the left thigh of Virgo. It is made up of the stars designated as Virgo 16 through 19 in the catalogue. Of these four stars, there is also consensus on that the two northern stars, 16 and 18, are spot on with 74 Virgo and 82 Virgo in today's nomenclature. 
Now, if the two remaining southern stars are designated as 76 Virgo and 68 Virgo, respectively, the only stars in the area matching the correct magnitude, which have been the traditional conclusion, and we draw a line between these stellar bodies, we do not get anything that resembles any kind of quadrilateral. So something is wrong. One star was never seen again at these coordinates. And this raises the final question. What then matches Virgo 17? The discrepancy was noted already by the Persian philosopher Al-Sufi in the 900s CE. And the enigma has puzzled astronomers for hundreds of years, if not a millennium. But in recent years, a solution to the problem has been put forward. Primarily, the coordinates for Virgo 17 and 76 Virgo is not a good match at all. There is, however, a way to put things in order. Some of the Almagest manuscripts have one of the coordinates for Virgo 19 reading negative one-third instead of negative three. If we use these numbers, magically and suddenly Virgo 19 instead fits perfectly with 76 Virgo. This leaves us with a missing Virgo 17. And here we also find the argument for Uranus as the solution for the problem. Uranus had in April 128 BCE just passed its turning point called Station in its apparent retrograde motion and thus appeared to be still in its position in Virgo. A retrograde motion is an effect of changed observational direction due to the fact that Earth overtakes an outer planet in its orbit around the Sun. A month or so later, the planet would have been spotted in a completely different place, or even being noted as to be moving. It turns out that the coordinates and data given by Hipparchus and consequently Ptolemaeus match the location of our protagonist celestial body. If we use our statistics and mathematics, Knowing what we know of celestial orbits today, and adjust for the change of calendars between the Julian, introduced by Julius Caesar in 46 BCE, and the Gregorian, introduced by Pope Gregorius the 13th in 1582 CE, it is possible to derive where Uranus was in the night skies at a certain date. And thus also when Hipparchus took notes on the coordinates of the stars in the constellation Virgo from his observatory on Rhodus. And it turns out that Uranus was in the exact spot where Hipparchus had placed Virgo 17. The date when Uranus was in conjunction with the position given for Virgo 17 was the 9th of April in 128 BCE. Better still, Hipparchus states that the star in question, Virgo 17, had a magnitude of 6. Magnitude being the apparent brightness of a body in space, as seen from Earth. It can be shown that Uranus, at this point in time, would have had a magnitude of 5.4 in today's standards. Today the value is 5.8. The lower the number, the brighter the star. All this can be derived because we can show that Uranus was still close to its perihelion at this time. That is, since the planet's orbits are eclipses rather than perfect circles, on the point where it is closest to the Sun, and therefore also to Earth. The viewing conditions for Hipparchus would thus have been optimal in 128 BCE. An experienced stargazer can see a magnitude of about 6.5. So in the ancient unpolluted Mediterranean skies, seeing Uranus, the furthest planet visible to the naked eye, was definitely possible. But how do we know then that these are Hipparchus coordinates and not Ptolemaeus' own? Well, Ptolemaeus says that his coordinates are given as they were on the first day of the Egyptian year in which Emperor Antoninus Pius ascended to the throne which was on the 10th of July in 138 CE. But this is not correct. The coordinates match the position of the stars, taking into account stellar proper motion, somewhere around the year of 128 BCE. It is concluded, therefore, 
that Ptolemaeus used Hipparchus coordinates, adjusting for the difference in latitude between Rhodos and Alexandria. Taken together, there are too many coincidences in this matter for it not to make up a probable explanation of the missing star and Uranus' corresponding position at the same time. Although not every astronomer agrees to this explanation, I will hold it for fairly probable, for now. This is an intriguing case for astronomers and historians alike to be able to pinpoint an observation in time more than 2000 years ago and to nail it down to a probable specific date and to find a planet right where there is a missing star. William Herschel will continue to stand as the discoverer of the gas and ice giant Uranus. Nonetheless, Hipparchus did convincingly see Uranus on the 9th of April in 128 BCE from his observatory on Rhodos, thinking it was a star. And as far as we know, he was the first human to scientifically note that stellar object. <laughs> Hi again. If you like this video, hit that like button and make sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel. And if you would like to contribute for me to make even better documentaries about the past in the future, please consider joining me at Patreon. I've put a link to my site in the description below. See you soon.